Today's guest on the podcast is Glenn Livingston. I am so excited about this interview, you guys. Do not miss this. If you have struggled or struggling with binge eating, do not, do not miss this episode at all. (laughs) Not for any reason. I shared in a prior episode on my notes on nonsense about why this episode was so important for me and his book, Never Binge Again, which you can actually get for free at youcanstopovereating.com is the special link affiliated with this episode. So you can stop overeating.com. You can download it for free, which is amazing. So enjoy this episode. Um, the, the episode, we try and get into all the nuances that he covers in the book, but definitely if any of this speaks to you, any of this episode, please, please, please go grab the book because the book will explain it in a lot more detail and clarity. And I personally like having the print book and the audiobook. I thought the audiobook was excellent as well. So I hope you all enjoy this episode with Glenn Livingston, author of Never Binge Again. Hi, and welcome to the Same 24 Hours Podcast. I'm Meredith Atwood, author of the book, The Year of No Nonsense. I'm a former attorney turned writer, speaker, and Ironman triathlete. Although right now, all I really like to do is lift weights. We all have the same 24 hours, but it's what we do in those hours that leads to our greatest health, happiness, and success. It's my goal to crack the code on a life of less nonsense so we can all make the most of our 24 hours. So let's get started. Today's guest is Glenn Livingston. It's great for you to be here. Meredith, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this all week. So the awesome thing that happened to me is I came across your book about seven or eight weeks ago on Amazon. Um, I don't I don't know how I how I came across it, probably searching for something to stop binging. But your book, Never Binge Again, I listened to on Audible and I was blown away and I contacted you almost, I think a week after I read it because it just, it changed my entire mindset and I'm in the business of if I can share my story and the story of other people that can help in any way, that's what I want to do. So that's why you're here. (laughs) Very kind of you. I'm glad that you're in that business. Yes. So let's get a, let's, let's start where, where you are and and your story and and how you came to develop your methods and and the book and all of it. So let's let's just dive in with your story. Well, sure. And I'll tell you that the end of the story, it took me 30 years to come to this piercing insight, the Mm -hmm. way that you you got in, you know, a couple of days with the book. And I'll tell you, I'm a psychologist from a family of psychologists. So my mom and my dad and my sister and her husband and my, and my, uncle and my aunt and my grandparents and sometimes I think even the family dog and (laughs) the the standing joke in the family was that when something breaks in the house everybody knows how to ask it how it feels but nobody knows how to fix it (laughs) (laughs) that's it's actually kind of an important joke because that orientation to life the idea that when you have a hammer, everything is a nail, that everything has a psychological depth solution that actually caused me 30 years of suffering. Mm -hmm. And so let me tell you the story and then you'll understand how this all came to be. I am, when I was 17 or so, I'm, I'm tall, I'm six foot four, I'm fairly muscular. And I discovered that if I worked out for two or three hours a day, that I could eat whatever I wanted to. And I really, really like to eat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you've ever been to a 7-Eleven and they're out of Pop-Tarts, I was probably there before you, (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know, whole whole pizzas, if not two boxes of muffins, boxes of donuts. Now, was that before, uh, just after 17 or were you always that way? Well, I always liked to eat, but I was always concerned about my weight. Okay. And then when I discovered working out, I realized that I could, you know, I could do whatever I wanted to. Right. For a while. For a while. And there there were prices that I paid because, you know, rather than looking into college and dating girls and studying and doing productive things, I was mostly working out, eating, going to the bathroom and sleeping. Um, but I did not pay the price of getting fat until later in my life. I was married at 22. 
And I got into a graduate school, which was about two hours away from where my ex-wife was living, my wife at the time. And so I was driving to a really good graduate school. I was seeing patients. It was two hours each way. I was working all day because I was helping to run a business at the same time. And I just didn't have the time to work out. I mean, if I had a half hour a week, I was lucky. And I found that I couldn't get the food off of my mind regardless. And I would be sitting with suicidal patients and you have to be completely present and lend people your soul to work with that type of a high risk situation. And it was hard for me because I was sitting and thinking about, well, when can I get to the deli and dislodge my jaw and, you know, pour the contents of the, of the tray into my, into my mouth. And I'd be working with couples after an affair. And I, I just, it was really important to me to be a good psychologist because I come from a family like that. And, and so it really bothered me. Mm-hmm. And my initial hypothesis was that there must be something broken about me psychologically. Like I must have a hole in my heart. And if I could fill that hole, then I would stop trying to fill the hole in my stomach. Right. Which a lot of people think. And I, I embarked on a journey, which was very soulful. and I don't regret doing it. But I went to the best psychotherapists around, and you could imagine I might know them coming from the family that I came from in New York. And I went to a psychiatrist, and I took medication, and I went to Overeaters Anonymous. And I even did my own 40,000-person study over the course of many years when internet clicks were cheap to figure out what areas of life stress were correlated with what particular foods people struggled with. And all of this journey was very spiritual. It was very soul enriching. And I would get a little better for a while. And then I would get a lot worse. And I was getting fatter and fatter. And um, not in a straight line, but the highs were getting higher. And my doctor was telling me I'm going to die if I keep at this before I'm 40 because my triglycerides were over 1,000. And so I don't have the genetics to be able to do what I was doing. And, you know, I was scared. But I still felt like I just I just couldn't stop. I was thinking about food all the time. I was eating massive volumes, and you know I was not looking very good, and I was not very happy. Um, a number of things came to pass, which eventually flipped the paradigm for me in my early, like early to mid forties. Um, and then it took me a couple of years to to figure it out and really nail down the system for myself. The first thing that happened was that forty thousand person study. And in that study, I discovered that people who struggle with chocolate, like I do, most of my binges started with chocolate. They would go on to all kinds of other things, but mostly they started with chocolate. Mm -hmm. We tended to be lonely or brokenhearted or or depressed. And I thought, well, that makes sense. You know, I'm in a bad marriage and, you know, things are not really working out for me. And I I am feeling a little lonely and depressed. The The other interesting findings were that people struggled with salty, crunchy things they tended to be stressed at work and people who struggled with soft, chewy, starchy things, they tended to be stressed at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I went Wait, to my- what is soft, chewy, starchy? Oh, like cinnamon rolls? <laughs> oh, yeah. But more, okay. yeah c- cinnamon rolls would qualify, but it was more like, you know, bagels and bread and oh, okay. maybe, maybe yeah, even yeah. pizza. Yeah. So that was the first thing that occurred. And I'll tell you the end of that story in a second, but I want to also tell you that because I never had kids and my, my ex-wife traveled for business and I didn't commute, I worked at home, had a lot of time and I developed a dual career. And my second career was doing advertising consultant for big businesses, a lot of them in the big food industry, also big farmer. And I, I actually feel like I was on the wrong side of the war and I feel guilty for having done this then, but I, I did. <laughs> and so in my third years, I spent a lot of time with food companies and I, I saw eventually what they were doing and they're... They're engineering hyperpalatable food-like substances to target the bliss centers in your reptilian brain and do it in such a way that you feel the bliss, but they don't give you enough nutrition to feel satisfied. Right. And, and so literally, I, I believe that every time you were looking for love at the bottom of a bag or a box or container, there's some fat cat in a white suit with a mustache who's laughing all the way to the bank, right? Um, And so I said, well, that that was a paradigm shifter for me because that was a powerful force external to me that had nothing to do with whether my mama loved me enough or whether there was a hole in my heart or whether I was in a good marriage or not. Then 
you look at what the advertising industry does and the advertising industry, most people think advertising doesn't affect them, but it actually affects you more when you think it doesn't affect you because <laughs> uh, your sales resistance is down. So they, right. they've got you right where they want you. And they're very good at making you believe that you can't live without their junk. I mean, if you think about it, the last study I saw on the number of messages about food that are beamed at us every year through the airwaves and the internet, it's something like five to 7,000 messages are, are beamed us about something to eat. And maybe a dozen of them are about having more whole fruits and vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So we're getting hammered and programmed to believe that this is what we're supposed to eat. And it's really not. It's really not what nature has to offer. Um, I also knew that from a neurological standpoint, that the part of the brain that responds to food addiction, this part of the lizard brain that you know is responsible for feast or famine or fight or flight, and really it's a, a survival drive, that part of the brain doesn't really know love. It, like here I am thinking that I need to love myself more in order to fix my food problem, but the lizard brain doesn't really know love. When it looks at something in the environment, it says, do I eat it? Do I meet with it or do I kill it? Right. That, that's what that part of the brain responds to. It's the, it's the higher parts of the brain, the, like the mammalian brain and the, the neocortex, where there is concern for, wait a minute, before I eat, meat or kill that thing, what impact is it going to have in my tribe and the people that I care about and what impact is going to have on the kind of person I want to be in the world and my long-term plans and like, like weight loss and fitness, by the way, um, or even spirituality or music or art or, or contribution, that's all in the upper brain. Mm -hmm. and, and so eventually I said to myself, maybe I, maybe loving myself then healing this hole in my emotional heart is not really where it's at. Maybe I need to be more like, an alpha wolf that's being challenged for leadership by this organ inside my brain. You know, I, I'd read a, a book called Rational Recovery where they were doing something like that for the black and white addictions, drugs and alcohol, where you can quit it, quit it entirely. Right. It's supposed to food where you have to take the lion out of the cage a few times a day, walking around the block. <laughs> um, and so I got support for it in that. And then the, the last thing that I did was I talked to my mom about my upbringing. And I said, well, this is really interesting. People run to chocolate when they feel lonely or depressed. And I seem to have repeated a lonely, depressing life in some ways. But what happened in my upbringing? And she got really embarrassed and she was almost ashamed. That I, she said, I'm so sorry. And I said, mom, it's absolutely okay. This was you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I just want to figure out what happened and how do I fix this? And so apparently when I was one year old in 1965, my Father was a captain in Vietnam, and my grandfather had just got out of prison. My, my father was a captain in the army, and they were talking about sending him to Vietnam, and my grandfather just got out of prison. And my mother was trying to have a second baby, and she was basically terrified that she was going to wind up a single mother with two small kids, and she'd be an army widow. And she loved my dad, and she didn't want to lose him, and she was terrified about that. At the same time, she was devastated when she found out that my grandfather was guilty and went to jail because she'd idolized him her whole life. And so the net net was that she was very depressed and anxious herself. Mm. And she, she didn't have the wherewithal to hold me and feed me and love me when I came running to her. So half the time she would send me to this refrigerator on the floor where there was a bottle of Bosco chocolate syrup. Do you remember Bosco chocolate syrup? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I would go crawling over to the bottle. I would take it out. I would suck on the on the top, and I would um, go into a chocolate sugar coma. And she could proceed with staring at the wall. And you know, if that were a movie, when I had that insight, Mom and I would have a big hug and a big cry, and I'd never have trouble with chocolate again, right? <laughs> but what what actually happened was that I mean, Mom and I forgave each other, and we did have a big hug, and. You know, it was a really good conversation to have because I learned a lot about her at that time. And right. I, I was able to forgive myself more. So I was softer on myself, which is important. That is part of recovery, forgiving yourself for all the damage you've done. But what what actually happened was that my chocolate eating got worse and my the rest of my binging got worse. And the reason for that was that there was this crazy voice in my head that used this as an opportunity to binge more. And it said something like, you know what, Glenn, you're right. Our mama didn't love us enough. And she left a great big chocolate-sized hole in our heart 
And until we can get out of this marriage and find the love of our life, we're going to have to keep binging on chocolate. Yippee, let's go get some right now. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. what, what that pointed out for me, that, that was the real paradigm shift for me because I realized that I don't have to fix these emotions before I can stop binging. As a matter of fact, everybody was in a bad marriage and had to find the love of their life had to wait until that was all fixed until they could stop binging, then nobody would ever stop binging. Because that can, I mean, I'm still single. It can take a, can take a lifetime to, to do that. But there's nothing wrong with having intense emotions, um, just like there's nothing wrong with having a fire in your house if it's contained in a well-maintained fireplace. It's only if something is poking holes in that fireplace that an ash can get out and leave. But when, when you have a, have a big fire, a roaring fire in a very good fireplace, it becomes the center of hearth and home. There's nothing wrong with that fire. People gather around it and they share memories and they bond and they, they tell stories. Um, and so I started to realize that there was this voice of justification in my head that was poking holes in the fireplace. And I started to think maybe it would be easier to take control of that voice in my head to either recognize and ignore it or recognize and disempower it or dispute it um, so that the fireplace would contain the fire. And sure, I can work on the fire over the years, but maybe I could get better faster. And this is the embarrassing part. Because, <laughs> because what I did, and I was never going to share this, Meredith, I, I was, <laughs> this is going to be a private journal, something I just kind of kept to myself. I decided to draw clear, bright lines that distinguished healthy from unhealthy behavior to make it easier to hear when that voice of justification was trying to poke holes in the fireplace. And you said an interesting thing because you said behavior. Mm -hmm. You said not like you. You said behavior to draw a line between different behaviors. I just think that's important to point well, out. <laughs> well, well, yeah, because the goal yeah. is to influence your behavior. Right. Yeah, see, most people think the goal is to is to solve all your emotional problems, but the right. goal is to influence my behavior. Right. And, and so I'd make a behavior rule, which was something like, I will only ever have chocolate on Saturdays again. I'll never eat chocolate during the week. And all of a sudden, if I heard a little voice in my head that said, you know what, Glenn, you worked out pretty hard today, even though it's Wednesday, and you're not going to gain any weight if you have a little chocolate. And besides, you can start this, um, you can start this whole rule again tomorrow. It's not going to make a difference. I would say to myself, well, that's not me. That's my inner pig. <laughs> and Eating chocolate on a Wednesday, that chocolate is pig slop. I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. This is all internal. I was, I'm no I'm a sophisticated psychologist. I was never going to share it. But <laughs> I said, I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And lo and behold, it wasn't a miracle. I didn't get all better the next day. But what did happen was that I no longer felt powerless and confused and at the mercy of this mysterious voice. I started to feel like it would give me those extra microseconds. I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. It would wake me up for those extra microseconds at the moment of impulse and give me the chance to make the right choice, or at least to remember why I made the rule in the first place. And slowly but surely, I would experiment with different rules. You know, I, I realized that I had to have things that I always did as opposed to things that I never did. So you know, I'll always start my day with two glasses of pure spring water, or um, I'll, I'll always write a hypothetical food plan for the next day before I go to bed. I mean, everybody makes their own rules. These are just some of the ones that work for me. Um, and over the course of a year or two, I really started to get control. I really started to feel like I had free will these were my choices. There was no point in rebelling against a rule that I'd set for myself in the first place because nobody was telling me what to eat. I could decide exactly what rules I did and didn't want to follow. And um, eventually, I, I realized two more things. One was that sometimes it was necessary to identify the illogical component or the lie in the things that the pig said. So for example, the pig says it'll be just as easy to start tomorrow. I did a bunch of research on that, and it turns out that it's not. Turns out if you're in a, if you're in a hole, you should really stop digging because the principle of neuro neuroplasticity says fires together, wires together. If you have an urge for chocolate and you eat chocolate today, that addiction is going to be stronger tomorrow. Whereas if you right. have yeah, it doesn't matter that you say on Monday you'll stop. It does. It's what you're doing. Well, and the only time that you can stop uh, is when you stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only it's always now, right? When, right. Like, like as I'm saying all these words, it's still now and it'll be now tomorrow. It'll be now on Monday. The only time you can eat healthy is in the present moment. So if you, you know, you never binge now, then you'll never binge again. Right. Right. So 
Meredith, that's my story. I, I, I love it. I love it. Um, so I was on my Stairmaster when I was listening to your audiobook, and when you explained the the process of taking the the reptilian brain or the lizard brain and giving it that part of you and your behavior, I guess uh, the name, the pig. Um, I thought, oh, I bet he got a lot of heat for that. <laughs> oh, I really did. I really did. But I think it's awesome. So explain about the pig and, and kind of how you do. And and I, we're going to have the book available for free at the end of this. But um, you kind of explain that so people aren't just like, whatever, I'm not calling myself a pig. Because I think that's what people hear. Yeah. Oh, you're calling yourself a pig. That's done. Yep. I'm turning yep. this off. So well, let's... Well, I, and if you look at the reviews, the reviews are overwhelmingly positive, about, but about 10% of the people really hate me because I talk about the pig. You don't have to call it a pig. You can call it a food demon or a food monster or anything you want to call it that's not a cute pet or distinguishes it from your inner wounded child. Because I, I definitely want you to nurture your inner wounded child back to health, but it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Um, this is more like an organ inside of you, which I want to teach you how to take control of in the same way that you control your bladder. See, I could be in a business meeting. As a matter of fact, I kind of have to pee now. Um, <laughs> we can pause it if you need a break. <laughs> not, well, well what, that's the whole point is that I don't really have to, I don't really have to listen to my bladder. I take control. I, I have to take care of my biological needs. I couldn't make a rule that says I'm never going to pee again because at some point my bladder is going to tell me otherwise. But, you know, I, I'll tell my bladder, I'm sorry, we're busy right now. Um, I'll take care of you in 20 minutes or so and we'll be okay. Sa same thing for your reproductive organs. Can't just run up and kiss someone that's attractive on the street. There are, you know, times and ways to approach people. And I'm, I'm actually a little bit shy in person, so it's not an easy thing to work out. But, <laughs> but, 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 um, but it's a very strong biological urge. And we live comfortably with it every day. Well, that, that's exactly what's happening with overeating. It's a very strong biological urge. It's something, it's, it's, it's a misdirection of your survival drive. So, you know, when you feel like just hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt, that's a joke for a reason. It's because your survival drive has been hijacked to believe that it requires this the same way that it requires you know, oxygen or whatever nature would have to offer. And people debate about what we would actually be eating in nature. I, I personally believe that it's whole foods, plant-based, but other people think it's, you know, we're all carnivores or whatever. My, my book is diet agnostic. You can use it with any philosophy. But the point is that... I love that diet agnostic. It's true, though. It's true. Whatever, and, and that's worth mentioning, because whatever food plan you follow or don't follow, it doesn't matter. This is not beyond that. As long as it's nutritionally complete. Right. Yeah. So, so some people try to lose weight really quickly and they put their body in a starvation mode and that always rebounds the other way. O over restriction results in binging almost every time. So I, I always have people work with a nutritionist or go to one of the online calculators and make sure that they're eating a nutritionally complete diet. But um, I kind of lost the flow. Where, where was it going? Um. I don't know. I just got <laughs> I got sideways too. Um, um, um pig survival well, so, drive. Yeah. So so what I'm trying to say is that if you feel like this is impossible, if every bone in your body screams for that chocolate, there's nothing wrong with that, and that awareness, that initial awareness that there's this part of you that wants to quit, but there's this part of you that thinks that it's absolutely impossible that you need this stuff to survive. That's the state of addiction. That's, that's exactly what we're talking about. That's exactly what this technique works for. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to realign your survival drives to something that nature has to offer so that you're not white knuckling things and feeling starving and everything like that. For example, for me personally, I discovered that, well, it didn't taste anywhere near as good as chocolate. It didn't get me high in the same way that chocolate would get us high because I I think that these foods are things that we not only eat for comfort, but we eat to get high with food. Mm -hmm. uh, because we didn't have chocolate bars in the savannah. We, we, we didn't have that concentration of, you know, sugar and fat and excitotoxins all in one place. We, we could never get that level of stimulation because we are dramatically overstimulated by food these days. Our brains and our pleasure systems do something called down-regulation, where the... Um, 
it can't respond in the way it was originally intended to respond to the intensity of pleasure we're presenting it uh, because it would just be overwhelmed and your your brain would be firing in all different directions you couldn't think straight mm -hmm. so it down regulates your response the same way that if you sleep underneath the subway for a couple of weeks you don't hear it after a while <laughs> and, and the consequence of that though is that you can't experience as much pleasure from what nature has to offer as you should. So an apple doesn't taste anywhere near as sweet. Um, you can't taste the subtle differences in, you know, romaine lettuce versus Swiss chard versus kale. But anyway, I, I, I that all reverses itself when you take some of the junk out of your system, and it reverses itself much quicker than your pig will tell you that it will. It'll tell you you're going to be tortured forever. What I discovered in this example was that when I wanted chocolate, when my pig craved chocolate, if I could get myself to have a banana kale smoothie either with the juice or their actual vegetables, that I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't experience the same level of pleasure, but the craving went away and it was very tolerable. And slowly but surely, I started to crave the kale smoothies as opposed to the, as opposed to the chocolate. And I eventually reached the point where I just didn't want the chocolate. And I haven't had chocolate in four or five years. People ask me, how did you deal with the cravings? Well, after a couple of months, they were about 20% of what they were in the beginning. Uh, after about six months, they were maybe 10%. A couple of years later, chocolate just looks like a big bag of chemicals to me, and I can't imagine why I ever wanted it. Right. right. One of the takeaways that I got from your book is that we all have certain foods that really light us up. And like you said, it's, it's chocolate. I'm kind of a salty crunchy, but I can pretty much it. Chocolate, pizza, gluten, dairy for me is what lights me up. All those things I love. Yeah. Um, but after a while, it's so true because I'm four years sober from alcohol and I don't even think about drinking. But, you know, the first couple of months of not having anything was really hard. But it does eventually kind of go away. We don't crave things that we know we're never going to have. It's It's like a prisoner that's given a life sentence and has exhausted all their appeals they they lose hope and they want to lose hope because it's a waste of energy and your brain is set up like that if you're not reinforcing the cravings if you're not eating chocolate when you crave chocolate eventually your brain will stop craving chocolate because it's a waste and right. your, your brain is much more efficient than that evolution has produced us with a apparatus that provided us with an apparatus that will point us towards places where reward is available. So you, you don't have to worry about being tortured forever. You really won't. Right. And so what do you say to people who say, well, I don't want to give up chocolate forever. <laughs> I, well, I can moderate it or whatever their thing is. Like if, if someone identifies that almost eating chocolate every time leads them to a binge or eating pizza. It's for me, if I eat pizza, that leads to a binge for me. I can't just have like one piece of pizza. I will eat everything in the house. Um, so what do you say when people are like, I can't give up pizza, even though I'm telling you that is my biggest problem. I think that's most people. Yeah. That's most people that I work with. And I tell them what we're trying to do is maximize your health benefits while we simultaneously try to maximize your freedom. So if you think about a city traffic planner, they have a wide variety of tools available to them. They have traffic lights, but they also have stop signs and yield signs and you know danger signs. And we can experiment with how strong a traffic control we need at a particular intersection based upon how dangerous it is. And most people don't want to give up chocolate. Most people want to figure out a way that they can eat it moderately. And so We'll try. I mean, I'll tell them, I don't know if you can or you can't. But a lot of times, the reason people can't is they haven't very specifically defined what role they want chocolate to play in their life and how much they want to have and when they want to have it. So I will have people that say, I will only ever have chocolate on the weekends and no more than two ounces a day. And that works fine for them. Some people have two ounces every day. Um, some people have it you know, once a month. See, if you put your, the, the reason that works is that decision-making wears down your willpower. So if you just kind of say, well, I'm going to avoid chocolate 90% of the time and I'm going to have it 10% of the time, it doesn't work as well as saying I'm only going to have it on Saturday and I'm only going to have two ounces. Because if you're going to avoid it 90% of the time 
and have it 10% of the time, every time you're at Starbucks in front of a chocolate bar, you're going to have to decide whether this is part of the 10% or part of the 90%. And that actually burns some glucose in your brain and actually um, it wears you down. There's a whole bunch of research on this and there's a, a little bit of backlog on research in the other way, but mostly decision-making wears down our willpower. So the first thing you want to do if you don't want to give it up is to set up a situation where you know exactly how much you're going to have in exactly what situation and see if that works. See if you can do that and make an extra effort to make it work because if it doesn't, then the only other option is to let go of it, right? So, so um, the other thing that we teach people is to try – when you have the craving, before you, before you indulge the craving, write it down. Carry around a piece of paper with you and a pencil. Carry around a smartphone that has a notepad function and write down what the craving is, and then pause. And then say, okay, my food monster, my pig inside me, why should I eat this? Explain to me again, why should mm -hmm. I eat this? Write that down too. Maybe the pig says, um, like I said before, you worked out hard enough, or, or maybe it says that- um, I deserve it. <laughs> I, I deserve it. Okay, let's take that. Pig says, I deserve it. Well then, breathe for a second and ask yourself, what do I really deserve? And maybe you go back to all the reasons that you decided to make a rule that you're only going to have it on the weekends in the first place. Like, um, I deserve to feel thin and calm and energetic. I deserve to not have to worry about my cardiovascular health. I deserve to be able to sleep tonight. I deserve to feel like I'm walking the walk instead of just talking the talk because I, you know, I'm a leader. This is something I would say. And write that down also. By the time you're done writing that down, probably you're not going to want the chocolate anymore. One of the reasons this works is because it, first of all, points out the lie that your pig is telling you because usually the pig gets you to overeat by telling half a truth and a bigger lie. Mm -hmm. So the half, the half a truth there is that you do deserve something, right? You probably worked hard and you're a good person and you deserve love and you deserve something. But the lie is, the bigger lie is that chocolate's the only thing that's going to do it. So this works because it disempowers the lie, but it also works because you're moving your thinking from your lower brain to your upper brain, right? Writing is an upper brain activity. Breathing is a sympathetic nervous response, the part of our nervous system that calms us down and helps us to rest and digest and tell us that everything's okay, there's not an emergency. Whereas craving is usually part of the fight or flight or feast or famine response in the, in the lizard brain. So by writing and breathing, you're taking control away from the pig and bringing yourself back into your right mind where you can make the right decision. Does that make sense? Totally, totally. And in order to do that, though, there's like a pre-step almost because you have to you, well, you have to recognize this pig, your pig, I love it, your pig, and you have to hear the pig. Because yeah. don't you think that that's kind of a, a step too, that some of us haven't made that connection? Like we're not hearing the voice, we're just autopiling and doing what it says, autopiloting? Yes, and the process of learning to never binge again is the process of making yourself aware and developing that muscle so that you can hear the pig, you can hear your mm -hmm. monster. Um, one of the ways that we do that is by using crystal clear rules and a very crystal clear definition of what pig squeal is. See, pig if, squeal. It, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> pig squeal. Okay, for those of you who don't haven't read the book, that is the sound the pig makes. <laughs> yes. Pig squeal. Well, pig squeal is any thought in your head, thought, feeling, impulse, or image in your head that suggests that you will ever break your rule between now and the day that you die. It's very, very clear, very, very strict definition. And the other bad reviews come from the fact that people don't like rules, correct? It, a lot of people <laughs> don't like rules. But, I but don't want food rules. <laughs> well, you know, there, there are several approaches to binge eating. There's, there's the rules-based approach. Then there's the mindful approach. I always tell people you can be mindful in between the lines when you yeah. make these rules. And you, you can also create rules that support mindfulness, like I'll never, I'll always put my fork down between bites, for example. 
or I'll, I'll never eat in front of an electronic screen again. You can support mindfulness with your rules, but this is a rules-based approach. And if you absolutely hate rules, then you'll probably hate me. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I want to just finish up what I'm saying so it becomes really clear. When you have a crystal clear rule, like I will only ever eat chocolate on Saturday again, then it becomes really easy to distinguish when the pig is talking versus you because anything that suggests you're going to have chocolate on a Wednesday is the pig by definition. What, what can the pig say that will fool you that you won't recognize and understand if your rules are really clear? So that, that solves that part using crystal clear rules. There are a couple of reasons why people don't want to do that. Um, they want to play blind archery or fuzzy archery because they have the experience of trying to comply with rules that are really too strict. Mm -hmm. And they, they want to be able to eat whatever they want, whenever they want, because their experience of dieting, and most of them have been good dieters, has been over-restricting and trying to white knuckle it, and they've typically bounced back the other way. So I, I really don't want people to do that. I like to, a lot of the work that I do is to help people to soften their rules and come up with something they can actually live with for the long run. Um, and they don't like to, they don't like to define one bite outside of those rules as a binge or as a mistake even, because they're afraid that their pig is going to say, "Well, you missed the bullseye, therefore you should shoot the rest of the arrows." up into the air or into the audience, right? You should <laughs> it's like if you bang one tooth out, you should go bang the rest of them out. <laughs> right, if, right. If, if, if you make a food mistake, you just should go to town at least till the end of the day. Right, that, that's start silly. on Monday. Right, but that's silly. What you should do if you make a food mistake is use the present moment to be healthy, recognize that you know having five cupcakes is better than having five 15, 15 cupcakes or a, 5,000 calorie binge is better than having a 15,000 calorie binge and just get up and aim at the target again. If you keep getting up and aiming at the bullseye, you'll get better. Collect evidence of success. See what you did right. Don't let the pig beat you down and tell you that you're too pathetic. Um, you're never going to get this. And the only reason it wants to do that is so that you feel too weak to resist the next binge. So don't, don't perseverate on the guilt. Allow yourself to feel it for a moment, just like you feel a little pain when you touch a hot stove. But you don't put your whole hand down on the stove and say, oh, my God, I'm pathetic. I'm a pathetic hot stove toucher. I might as well just. <laughs> <laughs> Although I burned myself last week and I, I kept my hand there so long. I wonder if I did that. <laughs> oh, oh. Anyway, what, 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 what they, I mean, there is a function of pain. You know, ch children who can't feel pain in this world don't live past four or five years old. There is a disorder where children can't feel pain. I learned that from Doug Graham. And they don't live past four or five years old because they don't pay attention to the right things. They don't know where the sharp where the sharp corners are. So you don't want to feel no guilt or no shame if you make a mistake because you won't have enough psychological pain to pay attention. But by the same token, once you've analyzed what went wrong, made adjustments so you can hit the target more accurately next time, there's no reason to perseverate on it, perseverating on the pain or on the guilt that's just the pig's game. It, it wants to wear you down. So you binge again. That's what the pig is trying to do. So let's talk about the food rules. Um, I, I love, love, love your food rules because I have found when, when I have historically lived by, by rules, I did well, but then I had not recognized my pig. And so I would live by my food rules until, and even they weren't they weren't overly restrictive, but I, I didn't identify the pig voice, and so the pig would win eventually. So the combination of identifying the pig and the pig squeal and knowing what is pig slop to me um, has really, really helped me. So let's talk about the food rules and um, before people start to object about them. <laughs> okay. Who makes the food rules? Y you do. Yeah. Meredith, do you want to talk about your, your food rules as an yeah, example? Yeah, we can totally talk about my food rules. So I have gathered enough historical data to know that gluten, while I'm not celiac, gluten is no good for me. It leads to binges. It hurt. My joints hurt. I don't feel well. I have a wheat allergy. So one of you have four different food rules, I believe, and one of them is a never. And so... When After I listened to your book, I started jotting down my food rules, and my number one is I will never eat food with gluten in it again. So, so that I'll, is I'll, a big never for me. I'll never eat gluten again. 
Great. I'll never eat gluten again. Not intentionally. Of course, you can get gluten bombed at a random store. But um, for the most part, yeah, never, never eat gluten again. Um, I M also, Meredith? Yeah. I think of every rule that we adopt as preceded by the term consciously and purposely. So I'll never okay. eat, I will never consciously and purposely eat gluten again. I don't, I don't actually write that in the rule, but I always think of it like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so another one of my nevers is I will never eat dairy again outside of coffee. <laughs> so that's technically a conditional, but I have to say outside of coffee because I will have cream and coffee if there's nothing else, if there's no coconut milk and I okay. can't have soy and I can't have almond. So I will never have dairy. So that means no cheese, no ice cream. Um, that's a never for me because I have proven this experiment for 30 years. I know these foods are terrible for me in many ways. So those are my two nevers. I, I, except for cream in my coffee, I'll never eat dairy again. Except for cream. that was I was trying to figure out how I would phrase that. That's a perfect. Except for cream in my coffee, I'll never have dairy again. Um, conditional rules are, I will, and, and I probably need your help framing this and I didn't actually bring my rules down, but it was around chocolate. I, chocolate isn't the best for me. Um, but it doesn't, I don't typically go hog wild over it. So I wanted to create some sort of conditional rule around dark chocolate, which does not have dairy in it. If I, you know, something like if I am feeling I need to have a dessert, <laughs> I will only have dark chocolate that does not have gluten or dairy, you know, something around that. Maybe you could help me come up with one. What would be better? How often would you like to be able to do that? Honestly, I don't want to give myself like a license to, to do it on a schedule. Does that make sense? Like I, Almost like if we have a spontaneous going out and everyone goes to the sweet shop, uh -huh. you know what I mean? And, and I'm, I'm feeling like, man, I would really like something sweet. That would be nice. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Um, which they, is why they, I haven't come up with it. So I actually haven't solidified this one because well, I don't want it to be weird. <laughs> well, first of all, it's also okay on your food plan. And this isn't in the book. This is more of a later development. It's okay to have guidelines. I put them underneath the template and I to illustrate that they're guidelines and not rules. And a guideline is something like I, I'll buy organic food whenever it's remotely possible. That's a guideline and not a rule because it's not crystal clear. You don't know right. when, when is it remotely possible. But you know what? I don't binge on lettuce. I don't binge on conventional <laughs> lettuce. But, but I, I want the reminder. I, I want that North Star to point to. Yeah. I'll only eat when I'm hungry and I'll stop when I'm full, by the way, is also a guideline because being hungry or full is very subjective. Food rules need to be externally verifiable. They need to be behavioral so that if 10 people were following you around all day, they would all agree whether you did or you didn't do mm -hmm. it. And so what I, what I might do, it sounds like you're afraid that if you said, I will only ever eat chocolate again twice per calendar month and only when I'm in a social situation with others. It sounds like if you did that, you'd be afraid that you were giving yourself license to do it two times a month, no matter what. Yeah. And it's like, you know what? If my pig's not squealing at me about chocolate, I don't really want to invite it. And that's kind of how I feel about it. Like if the pig's yeah. not talking, you know, why why encourage it? <laughs> okay. So, so then we, we, we would make a guideline that would say, I hardly ever eat chocolate except for social events on a cake. Okay. And that, that would just be a guideline. And I know my two big never rules are pretty restrictive. And it's, I think it's important to note that not everyone has to be that restrictive. But I, I know I've kind of been struggling with this for eight years now, and, and I know I'm ready for that. Um, also, having overcome alcohol, I know that the, these are parameters I can live with. But um, one of the things you talk about in the book, too, is having an always, always rule. And so I also added, I will always drink a big glass of water before I have coffee in the morning. Oh, there and you go. So I'm doing that. I, you know, I, I say I will always, well, no, that's not really an always rule. But one of the things you do talk about is about having your your meal plan, to have your rules that they line up with how you like to eat. And so I like to have a meal plan. So another one of my rules is I will always follow my meal plan. And whatever that plan is, you know, whatever I've determined that plan is of the week or of the day, um, which requires me to be mindful of that meal plan in the morning. And so I just say I always follow my meal plan. Gotcha. That's cool. And when do you write your meal plan? 
Um, well, I usually write it once a week and I just eat the same thing every day because <laughs> I'm that's that makes me happy. Um, so a, a lot of, lot of people do. Yeah, it's not day to day. It's it's week to week. Um, if I find that I'm traveling, then then my meal plan will be more like macro based. So I'll be like, okay, I'm going to eat 150 grams of carbs and 150 grams of protein, and I will, you know, log that. And so my meal plan may not be as food specific for that day as it is um, guideline specific. But okay. whatever I determine my plan is, then that's what I follow. Does your pig ever get you not to write a plan in the first place? No. Okay, no, it's not a, not a that, problem then. Not not right now. Um, but yeah, I can see that. I can see where that that would be like the next stage slip because I'm doing so well right now, and and that's the thing, right? You, you do so well, and then um, the pig comes, and then you find yourself in a three day binge, and so I'm kind of on that doing well. So that's good to think about. That might be where the pig starts to squeal for me. Your your, <laughs> your pig says it. Can't get you now, but it's going to get you later. So you can just focus on the present because it doesn't have a time machine. But what, 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 <laughs> that was Mer my favorite. Pigs don't have time machines. <laughs> pigs don't have time machines. They don't. Uh, Meredith, what you might want to do, it's up to you, is yeah. say I'll never go to sleep on Sunday without writing my meal plan for the week again. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Unless it feels like it boxes you in too much. But um yeah. And, and, and your pig will tell you that no matter how many rules you make, it's going to find a way to, to get you. But as a practical matter, commit to the process and you keep getting up and aiming at the bullseye and you keep making adjustments until you have the right food plan, that goes away. When, when I coach people, it's maybe um, oh four or five iterations at the most before the pig starts having trouble finding anywhere it can get out. Keep the pig in the cage. That's what you say. Or yeah, I, I should have used the pen. I call it a cage. Oh, yeah. Cage the pig. Yeah. I, I think this is so, so very helpful. I mean, I can't tell you how hard I've worked over the last decade to try and get a hold of the binge. I mean, and, and I I went 77 days one time last year without it. Um, and, and I think the, the reason I went 77 days at that point was because I was doing mental work around it. So I would say things to myself like what you're about to do is going to harm your ultimate goal. Like that was the the kind of, you know, mindset I was in. But then at one point I didn't have a name for it and I didn't, I, I hadn't identified the pig and I hadn't, it just wasn't solidified. So when I, when I read your book, when I listened to your book and, and I talk about in my book, how, when you give something a name, you can identify it and then you can change it. And so to, to give that voice a name, <laughs> the pig, yeah. I think that was so powerful for me. And I even told my friend about it. And, and so when we're in a situation where like, oh my gosh, my pig is squealing. And then, you know, he'll say, well, we don't eat pig slop. <laughs> you know so like we'll play it off of each other and um we used to our families would vacation together and we would call ourselves fat kids because we would just go to the ice cream store and eat like ice cream like fat kids and we realized after listening to your book that that was an affectionate term for that part of ourselves that wanted to binge like, like calling someone a little fat kid you're like oh the poor little fat kid wants to eat yeah. but by doing that we were we weren't identifying the thing we wanted to stop. And so yeah, now our fat kids are the pig. It. Yeah, yep. we were empowering our little fat kids. And so now that friend is knows about the pig and we, we don't make a joke of it anymore. We just say, okay, the pig's squealing, but we don't let farm animals tell us what to do. And it, it's so effective. It's mind boggling. It, it's it's incredible to me that it's this simple. Exactly. Yeah. Like I was almost mad at you. I was almost mad at you after I listened to your book. I was like, "Are you kidding me? Is this what? Is this all it takes?" I, I, I was I was mad at me. Yeah. <laughs> and I I suffered for so long. I mean, when you're in the middle of binge eating, oh my god, it's it's like not having a life. It's it's, it's horrible. So awful. Yeah. It's so awful. The self hate, and then you know, for for me, it's the the physical ramifications of it also the the mental the emotional like sugar and gluten make me depressed period yeah. they they chemically mess me up and so that just feeds and feeds and feeds and so to set these food rules and to identify the pig and to know when it's pig squeal i mean it, it's it's changed me so i am so grateful for you and I, I that's why i wanted to have you on the podcast and um so everyone else can now know so let's talk about you're giving away your book <laughs> 
you're letting, wait, you're wait, letting wait, we, 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 we give away the um, Kindle, the Nook, or the PDF version. Yeah. And you can you can find that at youcanstopovereading.com. And there are a couple other other things you'll get when you sign up for that. Um, so go to youcanstopovereading.com and sign up for the reader bonus list. And when you do, you'll get the free copy of the book in electronic format. We, we also have Audible and paperback if you want it, but it's free in electronic format. And because this is really weird and harsh in theory, you must be thinking, why does Meredith have this psychologist on who has got a pig inside him? And yes. what, what, what's... It sounds really harsh in theory, but it's actually a very compassionate process. And I, yes. I recorded a whole bunch of um, sessions, recorded a whole bunch of full-length sessions. I give them away for free just so you can hear how this is actually practiced as opposed to talked about in the abstract because it's actually very empowering. People go from feeling hopeless and despairing and powerless to feeling powerful and hopeful and enthusiastic in just one session. And I wanted you to hear that. And I wanted you to hear that I'm actually kind of nice in the way that it's implemented. <laughs> um, and, and then finally, I know that people struggle to figure out, well, what kind of rules do I make for this kind of diet or that kind of diet? So we created what we called food plan starter templates, where we looked at every possible dietary philosophy that's out there, more or less, you know, ketogenic, whole foods, plant-based, high carb, low carb, low fat, high fat, macrobiotic, point counting, calorie counting. And we created samples and we won't take responsibility. We're not giving them to you as a diet because we're, you know, we're not doctors or nutritionists or dietitians, but you can see nevertheless what some people are using to implement those dietary philosophies. It's, it's all, you can stop overeating.com and uh, click the big red button if you wind up on a different page and sign up for the reader bonuses. Yes. So sign up, get your free book, and then also download the Audible. I, I think the Audible was really powerful. Um, so I have both. And and that, and that, that's in my voice now. Yes. Yes. It is in your voice. So when you're talking just on this podcast, when you say that, when you do the pig voice, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's the pig voice. But I think it's important to hear your version of the pig voice because it's helpful. It's so helpful. Oh, that's funny. Um, So thank you so very much for not only your work, but, you know, you solved your own problem and you shared your story. And that is powerful. And I'm grateful. Thank you very much for having me, Meredith. Thank you for joining me on this episode of The Same 24 Hours. Remember to rate, review, and share this podcast. It really matters. I appreciate it. See you next time.